OK. Um, so hey, guys. I'm going here to talk about fractal packing, um, which is, I guess, a technical, less technical way of saying I'm applying techniques of Lindenmeyer systems to develop a single aperiodic tile, which is uh, math jargon that I'm going to explain. Um, but before I get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, why I um, chose this topic for my SYP. And um, mainly, it's just I really love math. I'm really passionate about it. It's what I want to do. Um, and I've, I exhausted all the options for math courses here at Newton North. Um, last year, I took calculus. And this year, I decided that um, instead of taking like a traditional class, um, where you know there are teachers and they, they have a, a rigid curriculum and um, stuff to teach you. Um, I was going to do SYP, and I was going to um, it was, it was going to be a different experience. Instead of um, having other people decide what topics to do, I was going to be able to uh, do the research for myself and uh, most importantly create new math knowledge that I think will um, that enriches me, uh, my, my ability to do math, my ability to research as a mathematician, and ultimately I hope the greater mathematical community. Um, so you all got copies of the abstract. And um, I'd just like to highlight a few points in the abstract. Um, my aim, the aim of my project is to try to find a single tile that can tessellate the plane aperiodically but not periodically. And I'll, um, I'll go over what this vocabulary means in the later sections. Um, in order to do that, I've been looking at methods of Lindenmeyer fractals, which are a family of tiles with self-similar properties due to the fact that they are fractals. And uh, the ultimate conclusion of my research is that it is impossible to uh, create a Lindenmeyer system that admits solely a aperiodic tiling. Um, so I guess first on the list of vocabulary terms to define is a tessellation. And what a tessellation is, is an arrangement of shapes that completely fills all empty space on a plane. So like squares, you can pack them together, and there will be no space left. But like circles, you know, you can shove them together all you want. There's still going to be that, those gaps between them. So you say circles don't tessellate, while squares do tessellate. And a tiling is a, si a specific instance of a tessellation. So on the screen, you see uh, three different tilings of a brick pattern. Like in the middle, you see like a very uh, rectilinear one where all the edges line up. Um, on the right, you see like a fishbone pattern. And on the left, you see a sort of staggered pattern. Um, and all three are tilings of a shape that can tessellate uh, the rectangle. Um, and what is sort of unobvious about tiling is that there are two main types of tiling. There's periodic tiling and aperiodic tiling. And periodic tilings have a pattern that is repeated infinitely many times across the plane, um, whereas aperiodic tilings never repeat themselves. Um, this can be a bit confusing, so I'm going to give a few examples. Um, periodic tiling is just about every tiling that you see in everyday life. So uh, the, all the brick tilings that I just sh showed were periodic tilings. Um, and basically, the, the heart of periodic tilings is that they contain um, sort of a single pattern that um, you can just take it, you can cut it out like a little, you know, like a tile, a physical tile that you could tile the floor with. And without rotating it, you can just move it. You can translate it in the plane. Um, and that, that just the simple copying and moving, the cutting and pasting um, and rearrangement um, is able to fill all empty space on the plane. So here is, uh, ooh. Here is um, something I call the macaroni tile. It's three unit blocks arranged in a sort of L shape. I call it the macaroni tile just because, I don't know, I like it that way. Um, you can take two macaroni tiles um, and rotate one of them 180 degrees, put them together to form a rectangle. Um, and this rectangle, um, well, it's a rectangle. And um, you can just copy and paste this rectangle. Four of them will form a larger rectangle. Four of those are the rectangles, you know, on and on. You can see in that last tiling, you can sort of infer that this sort of pattern will um, repeat infinitely across the entire plane. And that's sort of what a periodic tiling is. Um, the basic tile of that periodic tiling is the rectangle formed from the two um, little macaroni tiles. And uh, it's periodic because it has this repeating element to it. Um, aperiodic tilings, on the other hand, are tilings that cannot be reduced to a single tile um, like the periodic tile can. Um, aperiodic tilings are um, formed by repeatedly arranging a component tile into inflated versions of themselves. Um, this kind of tiling was actually very recently discovered. It was, it was not even known to exist until the 1960s uh, when a guy by the name of Robert Berger discovered a set of aperiodic tiles. Um, 
I'm going to show an, an instance, a more geometric instance of aperiodic tiling. It's the same macaroni tile. And what this macaroni tile can do is you can take four macaroni tiles and arrange them to form a larger macaroni tile with all the dimensions scaled up by a factor of two. Um, and then what you can do is you can actually take um, four of those larger macaroni tiles and arrange them into an even larger macaroni tile. Um, and you can keep on you know, doing the substitution on and on ad infinitum. And what happens is um, you have like, all those individual little macaroni tiles all um, arranged to form these larger macaroni tiles, larger and larger, until what you get when you repeat this infinitely is a tiling that looks like this. You can see um, there's no repeated pattern. There's no segment you can cut out and just place along, um, place repeatedly again and again to tile the plane like you can do um, for periodic tiling. And so what I'm trying to do with my um, SYP is I'm trying to develop a tile that is able to tile aperiodically but not periodically. So the macaroni tile uh, can tile both aperiodically and periodically. And um, what is interesting and what is inexplicable currently in mathematics is why this is the case. Why um, there are these aperiodic tilings um, with single tiles, but every single one of them also admits a, ser a periodic tiling. Um, just to show that, like, my, the topic of SYP is not just some strange mathematical oddity that I just f happen to find fascinating. Um, this is not just, you know, Jacob likes this weird kind of tiling and so he's going to do a presentation on it. I think that um, a study of aperiodic tiling is incredibly valuable for um, both mathematics and science as a whole. Um, aperiodic, excuse me. Aperiodic patterns have been found in, uh, across disciplines from archaeology to quantum chemistry. And you can see um, on the bottom, in the middle, is the Penrose tiling, which is the most famous aperiodic tiling. It was developed by a mathematician, an English mathematician named Roger Penrose uh, in the 70s. And um, what he discovered has been found in um, quasi-crystals, which are basically crystals. Um, usual crystals have a, a set lattice of atoms. The atoms are arranged in a set lattice, and that lattice extends uh, infinitely, or at least throughout the crystal, which is essentially infinitely from the point of view of an individual atom. Um, but these guys arrange themselves in an aperiodic way, using the Penrose tile as sort of like a template. And you can see uh, the sort of rhombuses in the Penrose tiles are mimicked in the um, electro, um, electron microscope scanning of this quasi-crystal. And on the left, you see um, it, this is um, a, a, a photograph of tiling found in um, a mosque or a temple in um, Isfahan, Iran. And this uh, is sort of like an Arabic ceramic tile work pattern that uh, displays some of the, um, you know, the aperiodic properties discovered by Roger Penrose. And so I think this, this demonstrates that aperiodic tiling is a, a, a wide-reaching, uh, pervasive, and germane um, element in a lot of um, evolving burgeoning disciplines. And a study of aperiodic tiling is beneficial to the growth of the a body of human knowledge as a whole. Um, the way I went about trying to um, discover new aperiodic tilings uh, differs from the ways that uh, previous mathematicians such as Berger and Penrose have tried to discover periodic, uh, aperiodic tilings. They have um, always relied on sort of more geometrical shapes, shapes that um, can already tile periodically um, but they impose restrictions on them such that they are forced to tile aperiodically. Um, I am trying to go from a different direction to try to um, generate tiles that are inherently aperiodic in nature without having restrictions forced upon them uh, in various ways. Um, and so what I've turned to is I've turned to fractals, which are another very um, interesting um, sort of geometrical oddity, uh, which is also sort of a burgeoning field, albeit not as new as um, aperiodic tiling. And what fractals are, are um, shapes that exhibit self-similarity at all scales. Um, and they can be natural or computer generated. On the right, you see um, on the top, there is this weird sort of squiggly shape with a lot of holes. Um, and on the bottom, you see uh, a cultivar of broccoli. And both of these, um, you can sort of see, especially clearly in the broccoli um, example, 
um, it has all these like little spires poking out of it. And each of these individual spires looks like the broccoli, broccolini thing as a whole. And each of those spires has little spire offshoots off of that. Um, it's a plant, obviously, so it can't be infinitely detailed because it has individual cells. But one can imagine, through mathematical abstraction, a shape that is infinitely detailed that takes the form of this um, broccoli sort of complex. Um, and so what makes fractals interesting and worth studying is that they are infinitely detailed. You can zoom in, them, um, you can zoom in on them infinitely, and they will still look somewhat the same. Um, so I, I've shown a picture of what is called the Mandelbrot set, which is possibly the most famous fractal ever. It was um, discovered by fractal pioneer Benoit Mandelbrot um, and just studied extensively. And remarkably, there are still lots of unknowns about it. Um, so so um, on the left, you see the, the Mandelbrot set. And on the right, there's a zoomed in, um, sort of where the, the cardioid shape meets the circle. There's a little cleft. It's called um, by, I guess, fans of it, if you can call it that. Um, it's called the, the, the crest of seahorses, because it sort of looks like a bunch of seahorses. But you can see that each of these seahorses is actually like another offshoot of the Mandelbrot set. So the Mandelbrot set actually contains a bunch of miniature Mandelbrot sets within it that are all paradoxically all as detailed as the zoomed out version. Um, and so the reasons why I thought, why I came to believe that fractals and aperiodic tiling may have some sort of overlap is that um, fractals, they are characterized by being formed of many smaller versions of themselves. And they have these weird chaotic boundaries so that they're unlike other geometric shapes. Um, whereas uh, aperiodic tiling, in order to be aperiodic, they must be able to arrange to form larger versions of themselves, like the macaroni tile can. Um, but they also, in order to fulfill my requirement that they not also tile periodically, must not be able to have a regular tiling pattern. And I think this complements very nicely with the fractal's chaotic boundaries, because um, it's hard to imagine the Mandelbrot set you know, tiling anything anytime soon what with its crazy offshoots and like random clefts and stuff. Um, so I had to do some research. Um, and what I found was a subset of fractals called Lindenmeyer systems um, that exhibit the self-similarity of fractals while also retaining some of the geometric properties of you know, just normal, everyday shapes like squares, triangles. Um, and they are basically um, an infinite set, an infinitely iterated set of substitutions. What you do is you start with like a line segment, and you um, define a replacement on that line segment. So um, Below, I've shown sort of like the generating, um, the way to generate uh, a Lindenmeyer system called the Koch curve. And what you do is you replace a line segment. If you look at the, the top left hand column, you take a line segment and replace it with what is on the top right hand column, that sort of zigzag bump shape. Um, and the zigzag bump shape is composed of four line segments. Um, and so for the next iteration, you take all four line segments in that zigzag bump shape and replace them with more zigzag bump shapes, right? And then you can see where this is going. Um, now there are even more line segments, and you can keep on doing this replacement over and over and over again until you get this infinitely detailed shape. Um, but you can also sort of define this recursively. You can start with the, the infinitely detailed shape. Or you can just start with the stuff on the right-hand column. You can note that the stuff on the right-hand column is composed of four smaller copies of what is on the left-hand column. So I guess mathematically, you could define it as the nth iteration of this Lindenmeyer system is composed of four n minus one iterations of this Lindenmeyer system. But since it converges eventually on a final fractal form, what you can say is like the infinitieth iteration is composed of four infinity minus one iterations of this Lindenmeyer system. But since infinity and infinity minus one are for all intents and purposes the same, what you can say is that this uh, fractal is actually composed of four copies of itself. And the reason it is composed of four copies of itself is simply because of the way it is defined, uh, because of the way you define it with this infinite replacement pattern. And um, that's what makes Lindenmeyer systems so um, powerful is that they are able to create fractals that tile themselves. You don't need to realize what the end result of the fractal will look like. You just need to define this sort of replacement setup. Um, and you'll know that the end result will always be able to tile itself.
And so you can create these candidate tiles. Unfortunately, the coat curve that I described before is not really a candidate tile because it's not a tile. It's only it's, it's a curve. It doesn't exist in two dimensions. And so you can't like you know carve it out of stone and lay it on a floor because it, you, it's, it's, it doesn't behave like that. But remarkably, even though they are like defined with replacements of line segments, there are actually some Lindenmeyer fractals that are able to fill space. Um, and uh, a famous mathematician by the name of Felix Hausdorff um, derived a sort of expression um, to determine whether or not these um, Lindenmeyer systems will be able to uh, fill space. It's called uh, the Hausdorff dimension, I guess named after him. Um, it's sort of a measure of how crinkly it is. So the Koch curve is not crinkly enough to completely fill space, but it's not completely one-dimensional. It's, 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 it's much more crinkly than an individual line. So it has a Hausdorff dimension between 1 and 2. But a space-filling fractal will always have a Hausdorff dimension equal to 2. Um, very quickly, because I don't want to run out of time. Um, a Hausdorff dimension is defined as the natural logarithm of the number of unit segments in its generating replacement you know, algorithm, um, divided by the natural logarithm of the, the distance, the displacement, you, if you will, um, you travel along the length of the curve from start to end. Um, and without explaining it in too much detail, uh, I've provided an example. Um, so in this generator, there are, um, you, you see at the top, you go to take a straight line and replace it with like, this little like carrot hat thing um, with a 90 degree angle between it. Uh, you know that n equals 2 because there are two line segments in it, and the displacement from start to end by the Pythagorean theorem is the square root of 2. So the Hausdorff dimension is uh, the natural logarithm of 2 divided by the natural logarithm of square root of 2, which is equal to 2. And you can see uh, I've provided the sort of progression of the iteration of this fractal. And you can see that it converges on a shape that actually does fill space in a, a completely literal way. And uh, if you notice, there are these little uh, square sort of grid units that are formed um, along the progression of this, of this fractal. And what happens is with each progressive iteration, these grid units become smaller and smaller and smaller until at infinite iterations they become infinitesimally small and are abs practically absorbed by the fractal is, I guess, a way to think of it. So um, that's really um, sort of what my project is about, trying to generate these space-filling uh, fractals that are able to tile themselves with the hope that they also won't be able to tile periodically because of these extraordinarily complex, strange boundaries. Um, and so I started, the way I started was, uh, I started basically with no knowledge of any, anything. I knew, I knew that there was a, uh, a problem in mathematics, which was to find a, a periodic tile that cannot tile periodically. Um, and knew that I wanted to do something with fractals because I thought that there was some sort of overlap, some sort of subtle interplay. But I didn't know um, how to go about it. And one of the problems I faced was how to actually represent um, these fractals, how to, how, to, how to draw them out. Because I can't draw them out by hand. It would take literally infinite amount of time. Um, which is also another reason why I was led to Lindenmeyer fractals. Because Lindenmeyer fractals are um, able to easily be generated using um, a computer program, uh, a class of computer graphics programs called Turtle Graphics. Um, if any of you have used like old Apple computers, uh, there's a Turtle Graphics uh, program on that. Um, I'm using a Turtle Graphics program called ACS Logo. Um, I just downloaded it for free on the internet, and um, I set up sort of, um, uh, I guess, if you will, a workstation where I was able to. Uh, create fractals. And so uh, above is a screenshot of my little setup. On the left, you see um, my command window and my procedure window. And on the right, you see the, um, the, the graphics window, which is actually displaying an iteration of the Cook curve in the screenshot. Um, and over the 17 weeks of SYP, I was able to amass a collection of over 80 fractal tilings. And so uh, what's up there is um, some of the tilings I've, I was able to find. Um, and what's remarkable is that um, all of these, with few exceptions, are able to tile the plane aperiodically. 
but frustratingly, every single one of them was also able to tile periodically. And none of this is at all evident from um, just looking at these fractals. But, um, but it, it, it was just frustrating to me because I was, able, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Maybe this will be, no, it's not, not this one. Um, and I just kept going through um, many of them without, without um, realizing why. But I did make some observations. What I did observe, oh, I would also like to note that um, the, the ones I'm showing are the ones that have Hausdorff dimension two. When I started this project, I didn't know um, whether or not, when I, when I defined sort of the, the generating path the generating method for generating a, a fractal. I didn't know whether it would turn out like the Koch curve and not be able to fill space, have that n have that um, sort of airiness to it, or if it were, was able to, like um, like the fractal I showed earlier, um, whether or not it was able to uh, sort of constrict those grid units until it became a two dimensional, uh, uh, yeah, two dimensional resident of of planar space. Um, so I'm only showing the ones that um, that were valuable, but I had no idea really at the onset what would um, make these fractals behave in the way I wanted them to. Um, but what I did notice is that when I did find these space filling curves, they often fell into the same families, um, one could say, of fractals that uh, have similar tiling patterns. So the, the, the three fractals I've shown above, uh, I've shown them in, you know, they, they both have this sort of like triangly pinwheel type of tiling. Um, despite the fact that they look really different. They have this sort of same common underlying uh, triangle tiling pattern. And this sort of baffled me because I thought they were really different um, in terms of looks. And since they looked different, I assumed that since geometry is pretty much based on how a shape looks, that they would have at least slightly different tiling properties, but they were practically identical. Um, and uh, there are also immense similitudes in the code. Um, it was literally a, a, a matter of slight differences, uh, replacement of three characters in the code that resulted in these large differences in external, um, like visible structure. But the underlying tiling behind all of these curves um, remained the same. And that's sort of when I realized I was baffled. I didn't know what I was up against. And I knew I would never make any progress towards finding uh, a conclusive answer uh, to, to, to my question if I continued on blindly like this. And that's when I turned to the internet. Um, I sort of considered myself, I guess, up until this point, like a renegade, just like doing my fractal thing against um, the mathematical forces of the universe. Like, taking my own approach to this problem. But this is when I had to really start thinking like a mathematician um, who relies on communal input. Um, I didn't know of anyone who was doing anything like what I was doing. All the mathematicians that I had studied who were studying aperiodic tiling were doing their own things, were doing other things, uh, were taking different approaches. Um, so what I did actually to find uh, the guy, I did find a guy, his name is Jeffrey Ventrella, and he runs a, a very nice site called fractalcurve.com, and the way I found his website was actually really kind of interesting. I, I, took a, uh, I, I took a screenshot of one of my fractals, one of the fractals I showed earlier that I thought was just, you know, totally unique and like, wow, look at this, I invented this. Um, and I ran a Google Images search on it to see if anyone else had come up with it. And literally, I came up with one, one result, and that was this guy. This guy is the only other person I can find, at least on the internet and within mathematical literature, who has uh, cataloged uh, Lindenmeyer fractals to the same extent I have, and more than I have, because uh, he's been doing this for 20 years, ever since like, you know, computer graphics first were invented, he's been around. And so his website and uh, my correspondence with him have proved immensely useful. And I think it was because of this connection with this mathematician that I was able to uh, progress um, how I did and re uh, reach the results that I did. And uh, basically, um, what his website provided me with, well, first of all, uh, his website uh, explained to me, and he explained to me, uh, what it, uh, a, a Hausdorff dimension actually meant. Before that, I didn't know what a Hausdorff dimension was. I just knew that there were some fractals that were like crinklier than others. I knew some fractals uh, were able to fill space in a, in a way that I wanted them to in order to be a tile. And I knew that some fractals were just sort of like a, a squiggly, squiggle drawn on the plane. But I didn't really know the fundamental reason, the fundamental difference between those two. Um, and he explained, to, uh, well, he elucidated 
uh, the concept of Hausdorff, Hausdorff dimensions. And uh, through his explanations, I was able to um, divine, I guess, the reason why I was coming across all of these families. And it's because that um, within all these families that have Hausdorff dimension two, um, remember that the Hausdorff dimension is defined by the natural logarithm of the number of unit segments n um, divided by the, the logarithm of the, num the, the displacement traveled L. Uh, and I found that th these families um, uh, with, with the same value for n, all of these families would have really, really simple, uh, well, not simple necessarily, but really similar tiling patterns. Um, these would be the guys who would all sort of fit together. So I, I pictured, um, these are off of his website, um, some of the fractals he discovered um, with n, the number of unit segments in the fractal generator equal to 7. And you can see that they all, uh, all are able to form this weird hexagony sort of shape and uh, tile very regularly and periodically. Um, and so what this leads me to believe is because all of these um, fractals in these families, within these families, are able to tile in these similar ways, um, there, there can't be, this is a sort of a hand-waving argument. I'm going to provide a slightly more rigorous argument, but the real rigorous argument is provided in my paper. Um, I, I, I was led to believe that there are no unique fractals within these families, seeing as these families contain um, all of these tiles that seem to have nothing distinguishing about them um, other than they belong to the family. Um, so by Ventrella's construction method, which I, I didn't explain very fully due to time, uh, by Ventrella's construction method, there are only a finite number of fractals that can tile with a given inflation factor um, because there are only so many ways, roughly speaking, of traveling L distance units using N unit segments um, while remaining on a grid. Um, and. Um, Within these sets of tiles, uh, like I explained before, there are no distinguishing features between individual fractals. They all sort of tile the same, like I said, because they belong in these families. And so um, since there's nothing unique about any of these fractals, I find it highly unlikely that this aperiodic fractal is going to sort of materialize out of thin air just through um, looking at Lindenmeyer fractal the way I did. Uh, another argument is that um, in the actual um, in the actual aperiodic tiling of one of these tiles, since they are restricted to a grid, um, there are a finite number of orientations it can have. Uh, if it's restricted to a square grid, it can only rotate through angles of 90 degrees, which leads to um, there being only four possible, um, four possible orientations. If it's on a triangular grid, there are only three. And if it's on a hexagonal grid, there are only six. And so um, basically what happens is if you progress through the entire um, the entire plane using this aperiodic tiling, eventually what's going to happen is that some of these orientations are going to be exhausted and then they're going to repeat. And a repetition of these patterns is going to produce a periodic tiling within the aperiodic tiling, um, like sort of a small instance of, an, of, of, of a periodic tiling, but enough to prove um, that these tiles must uh, tile uh, periodically as well as aperiodically, which rules them out for being the kind of tile that I need them to be. Um, so what this means, what, what the result of my findings are, is that it, it doesn't mean that a single aperiodic tile does not exist. I haven't like you know suddenly solved this age-old question. But I have eliminated what I think, at least from my perspective, is a, a, a rather interesting take on it. I've, I've sort of shown that uh, Lindenmeyer fractals cannot yield a purely aperiodic tiling. Um, and so I guess uh, to, to wrap up, uh, to conclude, I'm just going to show you some pretty pictures because to me what this all ties back to is um, aesthetics. It's about creating something beautiful um, and whether that is something beautiful uh, it's like you know, to the human eye, something pretty to look at, or something beautiful and elegant mathematically. Um, that's what I really wanted to create. I wanted to create something that would be you know, inspiring to uh, other mathematicians uh, and to other non-mathematicians, to, uh, to other people, to see that um, I was able to create something that was meaningful. And um, even if you're not you know, as into geometry and as into fractals as me, I hope you can all agree that um, that fractals and aperiodic tiling provide something interesting and beautiful and artistic within the realm of math. And uh, so I thank you very much for uh, being here and watching my presentation. Uh, Young. Yeah. Uh, did you run into any instances of like the Fibonacci?
Fibonacci sequence intersecting with your fractals? Because I could see some of that in just the pictures. Um, not the Fibonacci sequence quite. Um, the Fibonacci sequence, um, when it did show up, it didn't, it didn't show up in like sort of the ways it was tiling. There's none of this logarithmic spiral. It, it, was, it was really more exponential, I guess, rather than Fibonacci, which is uh, not, not exponential. It's sort of a, um, a recursive sequence. There are lots of similitudes. Um, actually, where I did find Fibonacci-like sequences is if you look at the number of, um, in each iteration, if you look at the number of unit segments in each iteration, sometimes they will grow within a Fibonacci-like pattern or even a Fibonacci pattern. In fact, the first Lindenmeyer systems that were developed by um, a, a Hungarian biologist, actually, named Aristid Lindenmeyer, um, he was using these, um, these systems to model the growth of algae. And um, what, what he did was he actually created a Lindenmeyer system that would grow um, like the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and if I had a, a way to write it out, am I allowed to write on the uh, board? We can move on to the next question. Okay. But basically, he found the Fibonacci sequence. He defined a Fibonacci sequence using Lindenmeyer system, so it is possible. But I didn't come across it. Yeah. Yeah? So is there a way to mathematically define periodic and aperiodic tiling, or is it a purely qualitative value? Um, for the most part, it's a qualitative evaluation. However, there are some um, ways of defining it. For example, um, a, a mathematician by the name of Joshua Sokolar uh, described in his paper, he, he just sort of laid out a few axioms um, that differentiate between periodic and aperiodic tiling. And for the most part, they're tautological. So he defines a periodic tiling, a tiling um, so that you can define a finite segment or, or sorry, so when you consider the entire uh, infinite tiling, you can take an infinite subset of that infinite tiling and apply a vector to it, um, a non-rotational. Well, you can apply a rotation vector and a, a movement vector, but not a scaling vector, um, such that the original tiling will remain the same. Uh, in an aperiodic tiling, you can't do that. You can't take an infinite subset of tiles and uh, do this, um, you know, shifting of stuff. Um, but basically what that means is that like in a, per a periodic tiling is one that has a repeated pattern, which is what I said and defined qualitatively. So really the quantitative definitions aren't much more specific than the qualitative definitions. Uh, yeah? Um, you mentioned um, graphics generation. Mm -hmm. Did you say it was logo you used? Yes, I used logo. Uh, logo is not really like I guess, a brand name program. Yeah, I, I, that goes to my next, my real question. Which okay. Is, did you look at the other sort of more modern, uh, widely available graphics programs like Nodebox or Processing? Uh, well, I, I guess to answer that question, um, my, my primary focus in this was not really to create the most beautiful pictures of fractals possible. Obviously, I like creating beautiful pictures of fractals, but my main focus was to find this aperiodic tile. And um, my, my main concern for these graphics engines were to, to maximize ease of use so that, I was a, so that I'd be able to uh, quickly and easily generate and uh, modify these, these fractals. And I think I got that with my logo program. Uh. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, guys.